Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, there are many things that are a natural pairing. They go good together. Things like ham and cheese, bacon and eggs. I hear that wine and cheese go well together. But you must be careful and make sure that you have the right type of wine and the right type of cheese. And there are certain ones that you don't want to mix together. But generally, wine and cheese go well together. They are a good pairing. Just like ketchup and mustard, hot dogs and hamburgers. There are many things that pair well together. I like wasabi with soy sauce, sushi with sashimi, ha gao and siu mai, kimchi with japchae. One thing I don't like to pair together with food is sauerkraut and brats. I might be Lutheran, but I am not German. There are lots of things that we find in our world that God has designed to be in pairs. We have two eyes, two ears, two hands, two feet. We have only one nose, but we have two nostrils. We have only one mouth, but we have an upper and a lower bite. There are many things that we find in pairs, even with people. We find pairs that go well together. Michael Jordan and Scotty Pippen. You like cartoons? Tom and Jerry. You like pairs? Laurel and Hardy, Lewis and Clark, the explorers. There are many people who are in pairs. Matter of fact, Steph Curry and anybody else would be a good pairing. If I was Steph Curry's pairing, we would beat anyone. And if you paired with him, you'll beat anyone too. Some pairings are really good. Even in the church, we have some wonderful pairings. Things that just go together naturally. We have the law and the gospel, the law that points out our sins, the law that shows us our need for a savior, the law that judges us and condemns us, the law that we fall short. And we know for all have sinned and fall short. And so we are burdened by the law. But it is paired with the gospel. The good news about Jesus Christ, the good news that God loves you unconditionally, that God accepts you as his child. He accepts you just as you are. There's nothing you can do to cause God to love you any more or any less. The gospel of grace, forgiveness of life, they pair together law and gospel. If you did not have the law and only the gospel, it would be less effective, less powerful. It would only simply be the exercise of what some describe as cheap grace or some form of universalism. And the law without the gospel would only condemn us and we would grow in fear and we would have no hope. But together, the law and the gospel makes it meaningful for our faith. The foundation of the teaching of the scriptures. Another thing that appears well in the church, confession and absolution. When we come before the Lord, and confess that we have sinned. God is faithful and just, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will grant that to you every time, for everything. Confession and absolution. As far as your sins are from the east and the west, so far as God removed your sin from you. 
Then we have the pairing of word and sacrament, the wonderful blessing of God's means of grace, the manner in which we can learn and experience and trust that God loves you unconditionally. Word and sacrament, through his word and through the sacraments. And we have the wonderful pairing in the sacrament of bread and wine. Jesus' body and blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. We have the blessing of the sacrament of holy baptism, the pairing of the water with the word, the promise of God that your sins may be washed away, that you might experience new birth and rebirth, that you can become born again by water and the Spirit. That is the power of God, to pair these kinds of things together. Even something like the Ten Commandments, pairing together the first table of the law and the second table of the law. The first table being, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second, table to love your neighbor as yourself to love one another that's a wonderful pairing today we see some pairings in our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 10 earlier in chapter 9 Jesus gathered his 12 disciples and he sent them out now we come to Luke chapter 10 and this time, Jesus gathers another 70 disciples. 70 disciples from all around the region. He gathers them, and then he sends them out. Some wonder, why did Jesus send out 72 disciples? Why not 50? Why not 75? Why not 70? Some Lutheran scholars say that 72 symbolize the number of known countries that was surrounding Israel during the days of Jesus. And thus Jesus was building on what he had done in Luke chapter 9, in his conversation with the Samaritans, that he has come to be the Savior for all the world, not just the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And so Jesus sent out the 72 to all the people. But then why did Jesus send out 36 pairs? Why did Jesus send them out two by two? And there are many reasons. Chief among them are easy to understand. Jesus sent them out two by two so that the disciples might learn about teamwork, about partnership. One disciple might be strong in one area of life and the other one weak, and vice versa. One might be strong in a different area and the other one could be weak, but together they would find strength. Together they could partner. Together they could encourage and admonish one another. They would be able to complement each other so that as they went out, they would be effective, so that it could be fruitful. Another reason Jesus sent out 36 pairs was so that there would be an eyewitness to their work. I've heard some incredible stories in my life. People tell me all kinds of amazing stories, and I sometimes wonder who else was there. Is it really true? Is it exactly as you say? It's too incredible to believe. How much embellishment is there? But when you have another person, when you have another witness, an eyewitness, a person who is there to hear and see and experience what has happened, it makes that experience much more valid. It brings credibility to the witness, to the event. That's why Jesus sent them in pairs. Another reason Jesus sent the disciples out in 36 pairs was because that would be a way in which they could find support for one another. The book of Ecclesiastes says that two are better than one. 
And you've heard about Ecclesiastes and what it says about the triple braid accord, where two people are together, and yet they are strengthened by that third cord that binds them together. And so as the disciples went out in pairs, they went with the Spirit of Christ, who binds them together to give them strength in what they do. And then a fourth reason, Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs, was that they could reap the rewards to experience the blessings. Think back to Exodus chapter 17. The people of Israel have escaped out of Egypt. They've been delivered across the Red Sea. They are now headed towards the Promised Land. They are wandering in the desert and they come upon Amalek. And there they have a battle and Joshua goes out with the Israelites and they are fighting against them. And the Lord God commands Moses to go up on a hilltop to watch over the battle and to raise his hands. And as Moses has his hands raised, the Israelites would be winning the battle. But when his arms became weary and he lowered them, they would start losing the battle. And so Aaron, his brother, and Hur, they stood on either side of Moses and they lifted up his arms. He kept his arms up. Even when Moses sat down, they kept his arms up. They made sure that they would win the battle. And by sundown, Joshua and the Israelites had defeated Amalek. That was the reward. The pairing of Aaron and Hur lifting up the arms of Moses. And so those are some pairings that I see in Luke chapter 10. And that's only verse 1. Another pairing I see in this gospel lesson is what Jesus then tells the 72, the 36 pairs, what they are to do. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. The harvest and the laborers. That is a natural pairing. We often think about the harvest. And we think the harvest is something seasonal. Something that happens at different times of the year. Or we think the harvest is an annual kind of event. It happens when everything has bloomed and blossomed and grown. But I was reading and studying this passage and it says the harvest is plentiful. That harvest is one event. That harvest has already come about. That harvest time is now. The harvest is ready. It's not some future harvest or many harvests. It's not based on time or season, but Jesus has already done it. Jesus has come into our world, born of a virgin. Jesus has come and lived a sinless life. He has come and fulfilled all of the scriptures. He has come and lived a sinless life, a perfect life, taking our sins upon himself. He has died on the cross. He has risen from the dead. He has ascended to heaven. The harvest is ready. Jesus has done it all. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, the harvest is ready. The laborers are few. Not that there are too few Christians. There are plenty of Christians, hundreds and thousands and millions and billions of Christians around the world. But the laborers are few. Many decline to engage in the harvest, in the bringing of the gospel and reaping and sharing and witnessing our Christian faith. And there are many reasons why. Some give an excuse. Remember last Sunday's gospel reading? 
the cost to follow Jesus? One excuse was, let me first go back and bury my father. Even though maybe that father wasn't even dead yet. They were delaying. They didn't want to follow Jesus. They didn't want to pay the cost. They wanted to just wait and wait until sometime in the future. Procrastination. Another excuse was, let me go and say farewell to my family. That farewell also meant taking care of them, watching all the children grow up, and then maybe I'll follow Jesus, or maybe I'll engage in the harvest. Because farewell wasn't just goodbye, or see you later, or I'll be back soon. Farewell in following Jesus meant it would be forever. There is no turning back. You may never come home again. That is the cost of following Jesus. That is the challenge we face. And that is why sometimes it seems like we just do not have enough laborers. Or Jesus goes on to say, the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so we think, I don't need to do it. We've hired someone, we've called someone, we've paid for the services. Let the professionals go out and Reap the harvest. Let the professional people do the work. Then there's an excuse of, I'm just untrained. Or I am under-discipled. I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to bring about a harvest. I'm not sure how to invite someone to church. I'm not sure how to have a spiritual conversation. And so there is that excuse. All the while, declining to learn or to be trained or to be discipled. And then probably the greatest reason why there are few laborers is because it is a hard and difficult thing to do. Look at what Jesus says. I'm sending you out no money bag, no belt, no backpack, don't bring a change of clothes. You bring nothing along with you on that journey. That's a hard thing to do. And a matter of fact, when you go to a home, they might not even accept you. They might reject you. You have to go find a person of peace, and there you can stay. But if they reject you, shake off the dust from your sandals and find another place. It's reminding us how difficult the harvest field can be. It is Jesus who then reminds us of another pairing. The lamb and the wolves. Yes, you are like lambs being sent to wolves. There are going to be people who reject that gospel message just as people rejected Jesus so they will reject you just as people hated Jesus they will hate you for following Jesus that is the pairing of the lambs and the wolves and as we get toward the end of our lesson we see yet some more pairings Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, and Sidon. Jesus pronounces woe to them. These were cities paired together, but known really to reject Jesus, to turn a deaf ear, even though Jesus had been to those places and performed miracles and preached the good news. They rejected to Jesus, and Jesus is lamenting. He says, woe to you, not because he's going to destroy them like Sodom, but he was going to lament for them, sadden for them, because of what they are lacking and missing out. So it brings to mind these pairings of, of these cities, brings to mind cities and communities and countries. We are in the midst of the 4th of July weekend, 
Independence Day, a day when we celebrate our country. We celebrate and give thanks to God for the blessings of freedom of worship. We thank God for all of his blessings upon our nation. And yet we want to take time to also lament, recognizing that we are not yet a perfect nation and will never be, that we are a nation still under God's judgment and God's grace, that we can do better as a nation, that there are times when we have forgotten those who are most vulnerable, those who are victims, those who have suffered injustices. We want to remember those things that we can improve on. We want to become a better nation. And so woe to us. And yet we can celebrate the blessing that God has placed upon us. Those are some of the pairings that I found as I studied Luke chapter 10. And then when the disciples came back from their journey, they were filled with joy. How wonderful. They were sharing about the power to cast out demons. Jesus had given them that authority. They were able to do miracles and healings and all kinds of wonderful things. And they were filled with great joy. And they returned and told Jesus about it. And Jesus says, of course, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He has already been defeated. You have nothing to fear when it comes to the devil, the demons, to sin, to death. For I will overcome those. That is what brings joy. That is why we can respond in faith. The greatest joy you can have, the greatest joy I experience, is when I share about Jesus with others. And they believe. And they accept Jesus. They receive Jesus into their lives. They follow Jesus. They acknowledge their sin and they trust in him. They pray to the Lord and they become baptized and become discipled and they become growing mature Christian. That is the greatest joy that we can have. That is the great joy that we can all share together. That is the great joy that we can celebrate through this gospel lesson. The pairing of 36 the pairing of 72, the sending out into the harvest field, returning with joy, knowing that God is alive and he is at work. Let us then begin our pairing together. In the name of Jesus, by his power, for his glory. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, God save your hearts and minds, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to continue our worship service.